Hey there, we are so thankful that you have made the choice to watch one of ACC's messages online. You know, as you are watching and diving into the truths that are being shared, we challenge you. You're sitting at your phone or your computer, hop on social media and be sure to use the hashtag you belong at ACC as God is teaching you different things during this message. But you know, we say you belong at ACC and we truly mean that, which means we would love to have you join us during one, our, one of our Sunday services at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. here at 710 Aqua Heart Road. So we would love to have you jump into this message and we're believing God is gonna do some awesome things in your life today. Good morning, family. Great to see you all here. We are kicking off our generous series, which I want you to know has been over a year in the making. We've been planning this series for over a year. Uh, last year, this time, we were kicking off our Oh What Fun series. We already knew at that moment we were going to be doing a generous series right now, and this is something I'm really excited about. You know that video you saw? Uh, there was about uh, a total in that video of about $1,100 uh, spent of the 26,000. So you do not want to miss what's coming. We have some really cool things planned in our act of generosity, our random acts of kindness. And I want you to know this is all on top of, uh, we have our missions fund and the things we typically support in our community and the stuff that goes on downstairs. All that continues to go on. We're going above and beyond uh, this year and, and you get to be a part of that. And I'm, I'm excited that we get to now study that together. You know, you ask yourselves, maybe you're thinking, like, what is this idea of generosity? Why, why should we be generous? Uh, we all recognize, right, that we, we love, those of you who have given your lives to Christ, we love a generous God. I don't think any one of us would, would question that. The, the idea of a God who loves you so much that he sent his son to this earth to die on the cross in your place, that he just, just in general came from heaven to the earth that he created for you is amazing. It's an act of generosity. And we see our theme verse for this series in Ephesians 5, verses 1 through 2. It says this uh, to you, believer. It says, imitate God, therefore, in everything you do, because you are his dear children. Live a life filled with love, following the example of Christ. He loved us and offered himself as a sacrifice for us, a pleasing aroma to God. And here's what that verse says. Our God is a generous God. He gave his life. He sent his son to this earth in your place. And you and I, as children of God, those of you who've given your life to Christ, we're called to imitate that. We're called to have that kind of generosity in our own lives. We're called to be generous in, in every aspect of our lives, to love people the way God would love them. So we're, we're studying this generosity this week and or in, in this month, and really looking at what it looks like. And what I want to suggest is that there are four steps to becoming a more generous person. And I want you to know, I'm not just talking about money. I'm not just saying, hey, go out and, and every, you know, spend money, spend money. Generosity is so much more than money. It's about your time. It's about using your giftedness. It's about using your treasure, your possessions. It's about using it all to, to love other people and to imitate God, right? And in this process of generosity, it takes these four steps. Now, we're going to talk about them over the next four weeks. The first one we're going to talk about today, we need to open our mind. And here, here's what I mean by that. The Bible tells us, right, that, that, that our mind is kind of the, the first part of this process. We're going to look at that here in a minute. But once your mind, think about this for a moment, is changed, once it's renewed, once you're thinking about things in a different way, 
you'll then be able to open your eyes. We're going to talk about that next week. And your eyes, when they're open, you'll now be able to see needs all around you that you weren't able to see before. Because your mind before maybe wasn't as renewed as it ought to be and you weren't able to see things the way the God you're trying to imitate would see things. And your eyes are now going to pick up needs at work and at at church and in your community and in your neighborhood. So we want to open our eyes to see need around us and then that's going to change into opening our hearts. On week three, we're going to talk about what it means to have an open heart. Because your heart, if you look, if you just see a need and you, you recognize it, but it doesn't actually spur something in your heart, if it doesn't inspire change in your heart, then it just kind of dies. The generosity never happens. We want our eyes to not only see the need, but we want our hearts to be broken for the things that break the heart of God. And then on week four, on the 23rd of December, we're going to talk about having open hands. You see, it all starts in your brain. It's a renewed mind that gives you the eyes to see things differently, which is going to change the way your heart is burdened. And ultimately, when your heart is burdened, you have to then act on it with open hands. It's when you open up and say, God, everything I have, all my time, all my talent, all my possessions, all my treasure, all of it is yours. How can I use it to help others, to love people, and to imitate you? So today, we're going to start with the, the first one, and this idea of opening our minds. Now, this idea of an open mind is really a recognition that we need to change the way we think. Let me show you where that comes from in Scripture. In Romans 12, verse 2, it says this. It says, do not conform. Listen, this is a, this is a command to you and I. Uh, if you're in this room right now, this is God speaking to you, and this is what He wants from you. Do not conform, Christian, to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. In other words, the first step in all this process is we need to be transformed. We need to not just be transformed, but we need to transform the way we think. We need to renew our minds. Because the, according to Scripture, Romans 12, 2, it says that there are two ways that our minds look at things. There is the way the world looks at things, and, and it's, sometimes it's really easy for us to conform to that pattern. We all have heard this phrase before, right? Look out for number who? Number one. The world teaches that you are most important, that if you want something, you should go get it. If you need something, you should have it. Uh, Whatever it is, you just look out for you. Don't worry about other people. Put yourself first. That's the pattern of this world. That's the way the world tells you to think about things. That's the way the world tells you to handle your money and your possessions and your time. Worry about you. But the Bible says you need to to not conform to that pattern. You need to to step up to this battle we're going to talk about, and you need to change the way you think and recognize that the world's way is vastly different than God's way. So having this open mind, having this mind that's open to allowing God to change the way we think is a really important step in this generosity puzzle. Let me show you uh, just a couple reasons why a renewed mind is so important. And I want to say there are a lot of reasons why having a renewed mind is important. But for the sake of time, let me share two of them with you. The first one is that your mind controls your your actions. I think we all know this. This isn't like rocket science here, right? When you think things, right, your mind is the thing that controls what you do. It it controls what you do. Uh, If three weeks ago or four weeks ago now, uh, Pastor Dustin... Uh, preached about how our words can change the way we think and our thoughts change our behavior. This is that same idea. Our, our th- whatever we allow to take resident in our brain is going to change the way we act. It's going to change the way we love. It's going to change the way we forgive. It's going to change the way we're generous. Everything is going to be kind of flow from the way you think. Even if you think about it from, uh, you know, your mind controls your actions, temptation starts in the mind too. The Bible is clear about that. Think about it for a moment. Lust and envy and jealousy, pride, fear, all of these these things, they start in our brain. We allow them to kind of, uh, we open up an apartment for them in there somewhere and we let them in and they, they, they mess things up. 
Because we know that whatever gets our attention gets us. Here's another reason why a renewed mind is so important. Your mind is a source, is the source for peace and joy. Your mind is the thing that will help you when you can renew it, will change the way you see. Two of us in this room could look at the exact same situation, and one of us could find joy in it, and one of us could be all mad and upset about it. There's a story about two twins, and these twins were identical in every way except for one of the twins was an optimist and the other twin was a pessimist. And the parents were really confused as to why their kids could be so identical and yet have these two things that were just so different. So they took their kids to a psychologist and the psychologist said, you know, I'd like to do an experiment, if you don't mind, to explore this a little bit. So they put the first twin the one who is a pessimist, which means he essentially can't find joy in anything. He always finds something to be upset about. And they put him in a room with any toy he could ever want, everything that you would think a little boy would love. They put him in that room, and then they, they put him behind uh, you know, a one-way mirror, and they watched, and they observed him in that room. And in there, he was just upset that the toys weren't as fast as he wanted them to be, and they weren't exactly what he wanted. They were the wrong color. There was no one to play with. He was just sitting in there pouting the whole time, and they're like, yeah, that's, that's what we expected. And then they said, well, let, let's take the other boy, the optimist, the one who sees joy in every situation. Let's put him in another room. And in this room, they, they put him in a room with a, a pile about four feet deep of, of cow manure. That's it. And they put him in there. And they go and they watch behind a one-way mirror as to what's going on. And, and as soon as the boy walks in, he's like, <gasps> he's super excited. And he goes in there, he starts digging. He's digging holes all over the place. And they're thinking, this is gross. Let's stop this experiment. So the parents run in and they say, what, what are you doing? He's like, man, with this much manure in the room, there's got to be a pony somewhere. <laughs> I mean, here's the, here's the, the thing, right? All of us, we can go into the exact same situation. We can see it totally different ways. It's, it's all a matter of the way you think. It's what's going on in your mind, whether or not your mind has been renewed or whether or not you continue to follow the patterns of this world and you're only thinking about you. You see, your mind is this source of peace and joy. Think about this thought for a moment. God is far more interested in changing the way you think before he's con- concerned in changing your circumstance. Oftentimes, you're going to find yourself in life in a certain circumstance, and you're going to think, man, I just, I, I'm constantly wanting God to change this. I want him to do something about it. I, I don't like this. I want it gone. I want it removed. And instead, God is thinking, listen, I want, you to, I want you to change the way you think because this thing I have in your life, I have it there for a reason. It's a good thing. It's, a, it's, a, it's a something that's going to make you a better, stronger person. Until you can change the way you think, I'm not going to change that circumstance. We need to renew our mind because it is the source of peace and joy. In Romans 8, 6, it says this, So let your sinful nature, sorry, so letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. There we have that word again. Letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. I want, I want that. We've got to ask ourselves, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we let the Spirit control our mind? How do we renew the way we think? How do we, we in, enter into this? And I want to kind of set the stage here. This is probably, I'm going to say two things today that I think are really important that you don't miss, and this is one of them, okay? In order to change the way you think, you have to, you have to, you have to understand this, that your mind is a battlefield. There is a war going on in your head. Now, if you don't understand that there's a battle going on in your mind, you are never going to show up to the fight. You are never going to go in to a battle. You're never going to come with weapons. You're never going to come prepared unless you recognize that there is a battle going on right now in your mind. And when you understand this truth, the simple truth that there is a war going on in your brain, then you're able to start showing up to the battle. You're able to start fighting. You're able to start working and renewing your mind. But until you recognize and can kind of give in to that idea, you're never going to show up. Let me show you a few verses in Scripture that show this. In Romans 7, 
It says this, it says, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Do you see that word? That battle word that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. I'm going to side note real fast. As, we, as I was writing this, this message this past Tuesday, uh, I was uh, at my home office. I was writing and I was preparing. And when I got to this verse, notice it says, I love God's law with all my heart. And then uh, everything changes, right? Paul changes. He says, but... And in that moment, I thought, man, that's a really big but. So I texted my staff, and I said, what would you think about a sermon series called Big Butts of the Bible? (laughs) I got shot down. All right, so (laughs) it's not going to happen. But you see in here, right, that (laughs) Paul's saying, "I, I love God's law. But the truth is there is a battle going on in my mind. There's this war. And then in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, I want you to open to 2 Corinthians 10. I know usually we we put the verses up on the screen, and this one's going to go up on the screen too. But if you have a Bible with you, would you open to 2 Corinthians 10? And then do me a favor, take your program and put it in your Bible right there, because we're going to keep opening to this verse, and it'll be good that we can look at it together. Uh, 2 Corinthians, it's in the New Testament, chapter 10. And here, here's another verse that shows us about this war going on. It says, we are human. This is verses 3 through 5. Uh, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. You see, see uh, notice all these battle analogies in here. We don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. This verse is so powerful in that it has exactly what we're talking about kind of all jammed in there. In fact, it has the recipe for how to renew your mind inside this verse. We understand, first of all, that there's a battle going on in your mind, that you have a war going on. And until you recognize that, right, you're never going to show up to this fight. But then this verse kind of paints the the recipe, the prescription for how to fight this battle. And one of the other things, I I want you to not miss this, is if we're looking at the three things according to this verse that we need to do to win this battle, let me put them all up on the screen at once. We need to go in with the good, we need to go out with the bad, and then we need to repeat. Now here's what's crazy about this, this verse. You would think, right, in order to make room for the good, you need to get rid of the bad first. That you need to just, in in this process of changing the way you think, you need to send out all the bad so that there's room for all the good. But according to this verse, right, it says that in order to fight this battle, you are going to need the mighty weapons of God. In other words, if you expect all of the bad, all the lies, all the things that shouldn't be in your brain to just evict themselves, it's not going to happen. You have to go in with the good. You have to send a battle. You have to show up to the battle with the proper weapons to kick the door down. So the first step is important that you do it first. You need to go in with the good before you try to go out with the bad. And before you try to repeat, obviously. So this first step in with the good, let's talk about this for a moment. I think we all know, right, that when you put good things in your body, you get good results. And when you put bad things in your body, you get bad results. Uh, I, I've told if some of you this story before, but when I was in college. My roommate and I were especially burdened for one of our other roommates Um, and he was having some issues in his life and kind of needed a breakthrough and we our hearts were broken for him so we decided in kind of our naivety that we were going to do a fast we were going to do a week-long fast together we're going to hold each other accountable we're going to pray for our brother joe and just pray for for cool things that happen in his life and for breakthrough 
So we went into this, and if you've ever done a week-long fast before, you know that day one stinks. Day two is even harder. Day three is painful. Day four is, is, is things just start like your body just kind of says, all right, I give up telling you. So day four is not actually that hard, and day five is not that hard, and day six isn't that bad, and, and day seven is the worst. Because what happens on day seven is your brain knows <laughs> food's coming. And you start all those hunger pains kick back up and you're, you're thinking about what you're going to eat. And we just happened at 12 o'clock midnight. Shelby, my roommate, he and I were driving to his, uh, his house in Indiana. I know, he has a girl's name. I'll just skip over that for a moment. <laughs> Shelby and I were, were driving and at midnight we realized our fast was over. And we passed a Hardee's. That looks good. So we stopped for Hardee's for a breakfast sandwich. Uh, just to save you, the, the, you know, the, 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 the details here, when you put bad stuff in your body, yeah, yeah all right, bad stuff comes out, all right. So it was, it's a mess, right? When you put not good things in, not good things come out, and when you put good in, you're going to have the tools you need to fight this battle. That's the understanding of this, right? In, in Matthew, uh, this is a, Matthew chapter 4 is when Jesus was being tempted. He's out on his own fast. He's doing a 40-day fast, and, and Satan is trying to tempt him with food in this one instance. And he tries to, uh, to twist Scripture to get Jesus, the author of Scripture, to misunderstand Scripture. And then Jesus says in Matthew 4.4, 4, says, but Jesus told him, no. <laughs> if we could all just, every time Satan lies to us, just say, hold on, bro. No. Wouldn't that be great if we had that kind of weapon, if we knew God's word that well, that we'd just say, uh-uh. Don't try it. And here's what Jesus says. No. The scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. What Jesus says in that moment is almost twofold. He says, number one, I got scripture in my brain. I've renewed my mind. My mind is thinking in line with the way my father thinks. And you can try to attack me any way you want, but there's so much good in my brain. There's the weapon of God's word in my head. I know God's word because I am God and I wrote it. I am going to be able to attack you with this good weapon. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't try to, to twist. Don't try to lie to me. But then there's this other thing, too, that you just see that, that Jesus is ultimately saying that every word that comes, that we feed, we ought to feed on every word that comes from the mouth of God. If you want to know right now, brothers and sisters, how do I go in with the good? How do I put myself battle ready? How do I have the weapons I need to fight this battle? You've got to put in God's word on a daily basis. This is really, really important. And I don't just mean on a daily basis. People will tell you, right, that when you, the best way to eat is to eat small little, like, meals throughout the day, little snacks, instead of two big meals or three big meals. It's actually healthier for you to eat a little bit at a time. And we also see that about Scripture. Let me show you quickly an example from, from David. In the book of Psalm, there's a few different instances here. And in Psalm 119, 147, this is what David says, he says, I rise early before the sun is up. I cry out for help, and I put my hope in your words. I love this. What he's basically saying is in the morning, I put in good. I feed my, my mind truth. And then not only in the morning, because then we get to Psalm 119, uh, 97, and it says, Oh, how I love your instructions. I think about them all day long. In other words, you know that truth? I, I, I thought about your word in the morning and I, I, I meditated on your precepts and I, I know what it is that, that you care about and now I'm going to take that and all day long I'm going to be able to, to chew on it. I'm going to be able to digest on it. I'm going to be able to think about it and I'm going to be able to think about you all day long. And then we see also in the evening in Psalm 16, verse 7, it says, even in the darkest night, your teaching your teachings fill my mind. Essentially what David is telling us is we need to be eating 
truth. We need to be putting good things into our mind in the morning and in the daytime and in the evening. We need to constantly be putting good in because that good, those are the weapons that we're going to need to fight the lies. Those are the the, the truth that we're going to need to evict the liars. If you're thinking, like, how do, I, how do I do that practically? You know, I'm at work a lot of the time, and I'm distracted, and I have other responsibilities, and it's hard for me just that this idea of constantly just meditating on God's Word, it just sounds like unattainable. Let me encourage you with this verse out of Philippians 4, 8 and 9. It says, And now, dear brothers and sisters of a Rundle Christian church, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all that you have learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. See, what this is saying is all day long, we ought to be feeding our minds. We've got to go in with the good. We've got to be spending time in God's Word. If I could summarize this real quickly for you, here's, here's how you show up to the battle every day. You've got to spend time in God's Word. You need to allow God's Word to not just be something you read just kind of rotely and just kind of passively. You've got to absorb what it's saying. Spend some time maybe on if there's a certain struggle or certain lie in your brain that you know you're, you're battling Feed yourself the truth that's going to give yourself the weapon that's going to defeat that. Memorize it. And all day long, think about those good things. Think about the things in your life that are good and and praiseworthy and, and noble and true. Allow yourself to constantly put good in to fight the bad. So that leads us to this this second uh, step, which is we need to go out with the bad. It's amazing how many lies we have in our brains that we've allowed to take up residence. I want you to think about this for a moment. Think about this like uh, your brain is just a bunch of, uh, of, you know, spaces, apartments, right? And we're allowing all sorts of lies to really kind of have a a place to live in our brain. Do You know, let me, let me, this might be mind-blowing. You don't have to believe everything you think. Think about this for a moment. You don't have to believe everything you think. It's amazing how we allow lies to, let me, let me give you an example. When I was like kindergarten age, at one point, I think my brother or sister, I, somebody cut someone else's hair that they weren't supposed to, right? So my mom, thinking she was doing the right thing, she, she told us a lie. And what she said is, you know that if you, if you cut hair the wrong way, if you cut it too short or at the wrong angle or whatever, all of your hair will fall out. And I didn't know that. And now I'm going to be really vulnerable here with you for a moment. I believed that until my sophomore year of college. I remember when I was in high school, a friend of mine was like giving his friends a haircut, and I'm like, are you trained for this? You know, I mean, I, I, trust me, I, I know it's a difficult thing and you should be trained for it, but clearly, right, I, I allowed a lie to change my behavior. It's maybe in the past you've been told something about yourself. You've been told that you're clumsy. And by being told that you're clumsy, it is changing the way that you, you live, right? It's changing the way you live your life. You now don't do certain things because huh, I'm clumsy, right? Maybe someone told you you were fat or that you were ugly. Maybe they told you something good, you thought, maybe they thought they were being helpful, and they told you, oh, you're just an artist, and now your whole life you've been in this little artist box. It's not a bad thing. That's a great box to be in, but maybe that's not your box. Maybe you've, you've bought into something somebody told you, and to this day, you, you've allowed that lie to have a place in your mind. If we go back to that, that verse in 2 Corinthians 10, it tells us, that we need to knock down. I love this picture. We need, to, we need to knock over. We need to topple and destroy the strongholds in our brain. Here's what a stronghold is. If you want to know what this is, 
you need to, a stronghold is a lie that you believe. It's something that you've allowed not only to take residence in your brain, but it is, while it's in there, it's building up a fortress. It's putting up a brick and it's, it's doing everything it needs. And it's now a stronghold that lives in your brain, but it is a lie. It doesn't actually belong there. Let me give you some examples of strongholds. If you've ever said this to yourself, God doesn't love me. That is a lie that doesn't exist in your brain. It shouldn't exist in your brain. What about this one? I know better than God what's best for me. Now we might all think, oh man, who would say that? We do every time we sin. I know what's better for me. That's a lie. I should do what I want because that'll make me happier. That's a lie. How about this? I should have everything I want. That's a lie. How about this? If God loves you, he'll give you everything you want. That's a lie. That's a stronghold. I'll never amount to anything. Brother and sister, if you believe that, listen, that's a lie. That person and action is unforgivable. That's a lie. You see, I could go on and on. There are all sorts of lies that we've allowed to take place and to, to kind of take up residence in our brain. And this idea of a battlefield, right? We, we know now that we gotta, we gotta armor up. We gotta get the right weapons. We gotta spend time in God's word so that we can go into the battle of our mind and we can fight and destroy those lies. We can go up just like Jesus did and say, no, you do not belong here. You're evicted. Get out. That, that thought isn't from God. That thought isn't based in truth. It doesn't belong in the way I think. You see, we have liars that always lie to us. Let me, let me tell you two of the biggest liars in your life. One of them is you. It's called your sin nature. Oftentimes, you are going to say things to you that are lies. And unless you have armored up, unless you have the weapons to fight off those lies, you're going to give them a place to stay in your brain. Let me show you some examples of our sin nature. In, in Romans 7, 23, it says, But there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. Here it is again. This power makes me a slave to the sin that is still within me. <laughs> this is so powerful. Paul is saying that there is a war going on in his mind and that his old nature is constantly fighting and battling against his new nature, and there's a war going on. And then he says, a little bit later in Romans 8, he says, those who are dominated by the sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. Essentially, you see that those who are dominated who are, allow their old sin nature to lie to them over and over and over again, you are constantly going to be struggling with sin. You're going to constantly not be able to forgive people. You're constantly going to be selfish and not generous. You are constantly going to do things the way old you would have done things. And another liar, if, if you're one of the liars, another liar that we can always count on to say nothing true is Satan. And the Bible tells us that Satan has dominion over this world. The truth is, I want you to understand this, Satan can't read your thoughts. He can't plant thoughts in your brain. He doesn't have the ability to, 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 to go into your mind, right? Uh, essentially what happens is he uses the world, he uses influences to speak into and to lie to you. Uh, here, here's a side note, because Satan can't read your mind, if you ever need to rebuke Satan in your life, you need to say it out loud. You can say it in your mind all you want. He can't hear you. Say, you know, Satan, no. We need to, we need to understand that, that Satan and this world are, are constantly lying to us. He's planting lies through people and through TV and through books and through media. 
think about this. Is this world helping you be a more self-disciplined person? Or is every little bit of marketing that you typically see all about you looking out for you? I mean, think about marketing slogans. And these are great companies. I'm not picking on the companies here, but think about just the, the hidden kind of idea behind these marketing slogans. Uh, just do it. Or obey your thirst. That's Mountain Dew. I love Mountain Dew. But <laughs> no, Burger King, have it your way. This is just the idea, right? Marketing, marketers know that this world, the way we think, we, we already love ourselves. So we can just allow all of these, these lies to take hold in people's brains. And if this, this church at, at, at 710 Aqua Heart Road doesn't fight these battles, then this will be a church of people who have these lies that are building a stronghold in, in their minds. And that's not good. In 1 John 2.16, it says this, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. I don't want you to miss the power of this verse right here. Your brain, your old nature, the world, Satan, all of these liars that lie to you, right? They are constantly telling you that what's going to bring joy into your life, what's going to bring satisfaction into your life, what's going to bring pleasure into your life is you feeding yourself all these things that are from the world. That you need to be selfish, that you need to keep what's yours, that you need to handle your time and, and keep it to yourself, that you shouldn't share with other people because the world's way of thinking is that those are, uh, the world teaches that those are the things that are going to bring you joy, your pride and your achievements and your possessions. The Bible is clear, these are not from the Father. These are lies. It's no wonder that we all have great intentions, that we can't see those intentions come to fruition. Think about it. You have the nature, the old nature within you. You have the world around you, and you have Satan against you. It's like, man, we have enemies coming at us from every angle. We need to show up to the battle, or we will never renew our minds. We're never going to change the way we think. And here's the third step that we're going to land on. We need to repeat. In other words, if you go into this battle and you think, today, when I get home, I'm going to open up God's Word and I'm going to put a bunch of truth in there. I'm going to put some weapons in there. I'm going to, and then I'm going to allow those to evict some lies from my life. I'm going to kick them out. And then I'm going to be good. You're wrong. right? That's a lie. The Bible teaches right, that every day you need to, to go in with the good you need to evict the lies. You need to evict what's bad, the strongholds. You need to destroy them. And then you need to repeat this process over and over again. Let me show you again, back, back to this verse in 2 Corinthians 10, the very last part. I'm going to read the whole verse again. It says, we are human, but we don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning. That's you and to destroy false arguments. That's Satan lying to you and the world lying to you. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture their rebellious thoughts and teach them to obey Christ. That last sentence, man, we can all work on that for, for a lifetime, couldn't we? It says that we need to learn how to capture we need to be able to be so good at going in with the good and out with the bad that when something is, is approaching our, our way of thinking, that we can see it right away and we can capture it and we can say, uh-uh, you don't get a space in my brain. You're out. You're done. And we need to be good at, at, at that process and we need to repeat that process so that it says here that we can teach our mind, this. we can teach our brain to, to, to love Jesus and to to be generous and to be loving and to not live the lie. This idea of teaching our mind to obey is an incredible thing, and, and we need to work on that together. And that's part of this repeat process. 
So as we do every uh, Sunday, we kind of end with this what now, God? What do we do with this information? Now that we know why uh, renewing our mind is so important, and we know that in order to renew our mind, we've got to show up to the battle. There's a war going on in our mind right now, and we need to go in with the good and out with the bad. How do we do this? What now? How do we repeat this process? Listen to this, this thought for a moment. I think the number one reason that people fail in life, the number one reason people can't find joy in life, the number one main reason that people tend to hold on to their stuff instead of be generous with it, is that they don't show up to the battle and fight the battle in their mind. They don't renew the way they think. The very first step, we have to change the way we think. And we need to be resolved about it. In Psalm 119, 112, it says this, I have made up my mind to obey your laws forever, no matter what. Can we be that resolute as a church that we say, you know what? I don't care what comes into my life. I don't care if it's good. I don't care if it's bad. I don't care if I like it or I don't. I don't care if it's four feet of manure. I am res resolved that I am going to love God's laws. I'm going to meditate on truth. I'm going to evict the lies. And I'm going to find my joy in Christ. Because the truth is, when we're talking about generosity, if you see things like the world does, you will not be a generous person. And if you let your sin nature, if you put your pride and your jealousy and yourself first, you will not be a generous person. If you think you are number one, you're not going to be a generous person. So let's change the way we think. Let's align our thoughts with God's. And let's get ready for a really generous month and year. Are you ready for that? Let's... Uh, I went over time by six minutes, but we're going to pray. We're going to sing together. Let's, let's pray. God, thank you for being generous. Thank you for loving us so much that you, you set the example of what generosity looks like in sending your son to this earth. Allow us now to be generous and to, to renew our mind, to take that first step and to change in the way we think so that we can think like you and love like you, and get rid of the lies and believe your truth. We love you together as a family, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for the truth that was shared in this message today. Please know that we as a staff and as a church are praying that what you have learned today, the truths that God has put deep down into your heart, will manifest themselves and grow themselves into something amazing. And as always, you can experience that with other believers, other people who are walking this walk of faith at ACC on a Sunday morning at 8.30, 10 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. As a reminder, please remember, you belong at ACC.